Um, and so I'm going to kind of uh, talk about how I went from um, helping to my journey of discovering what is good in helping. Um, so what if we didn't just feel good, but we got to experience good? Um, if you will pray with me over the message real quick. <laughs> oh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I pray that um, whatever message comes across today is a message um, from you. No matter who's here, no matter who's listening, that it's what you want them to hear. And I pray that... Um, in this moment, we get to experience your goodness and your grace and your love. Amen. So I believe that we are convinced that we can help other people in our own good, in our own ways. Um, we don't often look to God before taking action because there's often an urgent need right in front of us. And so it's like, this person needs X right now. I can do that. I'm going to do that. And don't, don't often slow down to pray and see if where the need leads us, what God wants us to do with it. Um, so on our own, we think we can help. We're like, yes, I got this. Um, and then we later remember, oh, yeah, I probably should have checked in on that one. Um, so as Paul says, all fall short of the glory of God. We can't do it on our own. We need to check in on those things. So our help must line up with Scripture, uh, be Spirit-led, and in that way, we can experience doing good for God. Um, God brought me to this message or this verse today. So let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. And outdo one another in showing honor. Sometimes my uh, help, my generosity hasn't been without hypocrisy. Sometimes it's been self-serving, but more to make me feel good than as helping the other person. Sometimes my generosity has caused harm. And my guess is I'm not alone in that. Um, so how do we make sure that our generosity, that our helping is doing the ultimate good that it can do, what God wants to see come from that? How do we cling to what is good and outdo one another in showing love? Um, so Pastor Dave talked a few weeks ago about how generosity isn't just about um, helping those that are financially poor or don't have um, physical needs, things like that. But it's also about reaching out to the wealthy. It's, it's about reaching out to everybody and helping them to know the goodness of God. Um, in America, we're very convinced about what poverty is. Um, we're very single focused in that it's you don't have resources, you don't have money, you don't have those types of things. Um, but worldwide, there's kind of a different view about poverty, and that is that it's not the lack of material things, it's the disconnection of the spiritual. It's the lack of relationship. Because when you're in relationship, you have people that you can rely on, right? When, when you don't have those things, you feel alone. And there's a lot of uh, shame in that culture. Um, so because this is the way that we see things through our human perspective, we're not able to see that it's a soul issue. So our, some of our solutions is in, in America is we have uh, drive-through food box giveaways now, especially after COVID, that became really popular, um, which is still a help. But we don't interact with the people as they come through. It's a 30-second, here's your box, hope this helps, have a good day. We never see them again. Um, so we, the problem is, we, like I said, we can't separate the physical need from the spiritual need. And so that's something that I know I've seen our food pantry strives to do. They try to relate with each individual that comes in. They treat each person with dignity and respect. They offer to pray with them and look at past just the need that we're providing with the food but what the person needs as well. Um, we were created with the desire to relieve suffering. Um, but sometimes relief isn't the only answer, right? Um, so you can have a brain tumor and a headache, right? Take some aspirin, the pain's gone away, but you're not addressing the full symptom. And the symptom um, 
that we're not addressing the symptom of the brain tumor. So in experiencing the world today, we have a lack of love. Um, we might not think so because people talk about love all the time, but we have a lack of real love. Um, many of you guys probably heard about the Asbury Revival. Anybody not hear about that? Uh, <laughs> it was a big event. A lot of uh, lives changed, I think, through that, beyond just the people that were in that building, right? And the sermon was on, um, was on the, this, was on Romans, and like we're talking about, sorry. And so Zach Mir Krebs, hope I'm saying that right, is the assistant soccer coach. And he's also the leadership development co coordinator for the missions of an um, organization called Envision. And what he was giving the message that day. And his message was on becoming love in action. And he defined love for them. Um, so let's go through the verse first and see what, what the Bible has to say about that. So let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. So if, can you, if you can finish the phrase for me. Love is... Patient, somebody said. How about, sis, what does the world say love is? Love is love. I don't know, there's commercials about it, there's shows about it, everybody's talking about it. I hear it all over the place. Um, and so we're, we're inundated with that message. But the problem is, is that love isn't love. There's four different kinds of love. We just, in America, have our American English, right? And... <laughs> Love is everything, like everything is awesome. So the four different kinds of love are um, agape love, which is God's love. We can't replicate that, right? That's what God gives to us when we follow him. Eros love, which is the romantic love. Can you hit the button? It's not going. <laughs> Philia, which is the friend love, and storge, which is parental love. That's the kind of love that children have for their parents. Um, what was huge about the message in, um, gosh, at Asbury was that he explained that love is abused today. There are many people that have experienced horrible things in the name of love and been told that it's out of love. And so when he redefined what love was, there, I think that a lot of people in that room had no idea what it could be. And then in, when he was going through the verse, and he was talking about how it is not us to take revenge in that, but to seek God for our healing, I think it really stoked something in people's hearts in that as the Holy Spirit moved through that. In America, especially, we are agape poor today, I say. Love insecure, if you will. <laughs> uh, we were created for a relationship with God. Um, when our relationship with God is good, 
the rest isn't as hard to deal with. It doesn't mean all the struggles go away. We often still are dealing with lack of resources and poverty and pain. But those things aren't as difficult when we are in right relationship with God. Um, it's not the um, easiest slide to see, but this is like in a, a representation of what our relationship with God looks like. So when it's in right standing. So God is above all things, right? And then so when our self, when what we do with ourselves aligns with God, and then we are in right relationship with God. Um, when, um, so when we're, sorry, when our image of self aligns with what God's purpose is for us, that's when we are in right relationship with God. Um, and with others. So we're, um, we're supposed to treat others with honor, right, in our verse. And so what does that love for others look like when we are in right, right relationship with God? So again, we go back to where we only have so many words in the American language. In Greek, they had a, quite a few more. Um, so philoftia is a term for self-love. Um, there's two different types again. Like there's so many things about our world that we have such limited knowledge on. So there's the self-love, right? Narcissistic love where it's all about you. And then there's the self-love with the understanding that you were created in the image of God. And that's who you are to love. And then again, we are over creation as well. And so when we recognize that, recognize that we're in the image of God and God created all things, that brings us to the circle of being in right relationship with God. But due to sin and broken relationships with God, um, we feel ashamed in our humanness. And because of our broken relationship we got with God, we create broken solutions to our problems. Um, so as Dave talked about reaching out to the wealthy and the people that seem they have it all together, um, having a wealth of materials or a wealth of pride is, um, and thinking we can do everything in our own strength is kind of like having a God complex. It's not honoring that God is above us. So when we have the things that we think we can do it all ourselves, um, what, do we, what do we need to rely on? Right, And so once we see that we have that broken relationship, then we can understand that we need to rely on God. Um, one of the things that's really amazing is when you think something, you can often believe it really fast. Right, So when we believe it, that's what we think it is until we're proven wrong or something happens. Right, So all of our thoughts, we need to measure up against something that's true. right? Something that's factual. And so... Um, we line that up against Scripture, and we check it with the truth of God. We talk to our other friends and family that are in church about the things that we need to go through. Um, one way that we can help people confirm that what, what they think they are... So, sorry. <laughs> so let me reverse that. So when people are poor and we help them in that situation as being poor, that's what they think they are. But when we help somebody in that situation as an image bearer of God, then that's what they can begin to believe that they are. So the more help that is given out without addressing the soul and the deeper um, issues, the more the person will go into the belief that that's it. There's nothing more that they can do beyond that. So it's like so very important to, for us to learn and that I had to learn the hard way about how helping people in the wrong way is hurting them. <laughs> um, so again, with our verse, let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters, outdo one another in showing honor. Um, what if we could... Um, experience good more than just feel good. Um, it feels good to help people. <laughs> it feels good to, to relieve a need. Um, but our feelings are temporary, fleeting, sporadic, and often lie to us. Um, and the crazy thing is sometimes being wrong feels 
the same as being right until we know that it's wrong. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's pretty, pretty clear that we need to do more than just rely on our feelings for what we're doing and make sure that's lining up with the truth of Scripture. So what if we did experience good more than we felt it? What if we got to witness and experience the change God's making in other people's lives? Um, oh, many of you probably know I was really involved in Revolution when I was here until Bill planted Revolution Community Church. Um, and I experienced good there. I saw life after life changed by God. Uh, I also experienced that I still wasn't helping in the way that God wanted me to in all those instances, that I was still helping under my own power. Um, and the reason I came to that conclusion is I saw that I was like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. And I was shaving off the sides in the process, and in that process I was shaving off time with my family and taking care of them the way that God wanted me to. Um, shaving off other areas where God wanted me to help where I wasn't able to because my time was consumed at Revolution. And I also shaved off the opportunities for other people who God had called to serve because I was serving in those roles. So my helping not only hurt me, but hurt other people. That's not the only place in my life where I've done that. Um, in my family, we kind of have this hereditary condition called the savior complex. Uh, <laughs> So, um, man, yeah. So <laughs> I wanted to help my friends so bad. I was like, I was just the helper all the time. So when I was younger, um, when I was 11, I used to babysit. We lived in a family-oriented trailer park, and I was making lots of money babysitting these three boys. They were one, three, and five. So that was fun. Um, <laughs> they loved to play in the dirt, which was fun. Every once in a while, the five-year-old would lock us out of the house, so that wasn't fun. Uh, <laughs> but he finally would let us back in. Usually, I had to convince him we'd get ice cream. But um, <laughs> it took a lot of begging sometimes. Um, but what I had in that instance was I had money, right? I was 11, and I got paid to babysit full-time during the summer. Um, being in this trailer park, you can imagine there's probably not a lot of people with a lot of money. But the ice cream man came through every day during the summer. And I had money because I babysat. So I made sure all my friends had ice cream and candy. But what I didn't have was any money at the end. So I had nothing to show for my babysitting. Um, and their parents all had to pay the dentist. So they had no money. Um, <laughs> so again, not quite the best way of helping my friends. But it felt really good. Everybody loved to get candy. Um, it continued through high school, so um, my high school friends, uh, we hung out at what's called Smoker's Corner, so you can imagine what we did. Um, I worked through high school. Uh, most of my friends didn't work, so again, I was always one that had money, um, so I always had cigarettes. I always had whatever it was that we needed to do at that time, food, whatever. Obviously, that wasn't the best thing for my friends. Um, I had a car because I worked, so if my friend didn't want to go to class because of some amazingly horrible reason that they came up with, we all agreed, and I would drive them around. Uh, <laughs> didn't help very much there, and it hurt them and me, because we both missed school. We both weren't honoring our parents. As teenagers, we really believe that we know what we need, right? This is going to fix the thing right now. Um, so one of my friends uh, found herself pregnant at 16 and didn't want to tell her parents because um, she was going to get in trouble, like a lot of trouble. So she had come up with some money to take care of the problem but still needed some more, and I fulfilled that need. So I still feel a lot of shame and guilt for helping to end the life of that child. So what I thought was helping was really hurting. Um, one more example um, that was pretty, um, pretty big in my life is my high school sweetheart. Everybody knows how that goes, right? Love of your life forever. 
Um, and I was going to save him and help him and do everything for him, um, which didn't help him and didn't save him and didn't help us. Um, I found myself uh, pregnant, too, at 19 and um, tried to help him in that process. Uh, he had moved in with my parents and I for a little while, but he wasn't ready for, those, for that level, and so it was gone. Came back a couple years later, and I was like, all right, this is what God wants, right? We created life. We're going to do this, and I'm going to help him do it. And I got him a job, and I got a, you know, we did all the things, and I helped him with all the things. But it wasn't in his power, it wasn't in my power. It was without God, right? It wasn't happening. And he wasn't ready for that. It was only things, the things that I thought I was helping with weren't moving anything forward because I was doing it absent the scriptures without honoring and seeking God first. Um, those are things that he had to choose and God could do to change in him, right? And I couldn't make those things happen. So as I continued my journey as becoming a better Christian, like Bible study and learning those things, trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing and how I could really help people, um, is when I found um, that I was starting to, I was dating John long distance, and I was trying really hard not to do things on my own power, but to leave things in God's hands. Um, excuse me, I constantly had to think about not going into rescue mode no matter what. Um, so I can remember there was a day he had come to visit some friends um, back in Reno, and my mom was like, aren't you guys supposed to hang out? And I was like, well, whatever happens, happens. I can't make it happen. And like in that moment, I really felt the relief that I acknowledged the fact I couldn't make things happen. Only God could. And thankfully, God did. So... <laughs> so so we've been married 10 years, and we have, um, he adopted Lizzie and Isabel, and we have two other children, LJ and Katie. Um, and again, continuing to, I have to not be in fix-it mode and rescue mode all the time. Um, so the ramifications of our helping can be felt for generations. So, you know, my friend that I helped in high school has to deal with that decision for the rest of her life. Um, the friends that maybe didn't graduate high school had to deal with that from ditching school with me. Um, my way of helping made me feel good temporarily, but in the long run, it hurt the person that I was trying to help and me. Um, we can give money. We can give people different clothes, different names, support their belief system, even their new identity. But if we don't give the truth of God's love, all is for nothing. We can't help them without hurting them absent the love of God. So again, back to our verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Grace will not call what is wrong right. If there is no wrong, then there is no need for grace, and there was no need for Jesus. So don't let our love be fake, and don't let our help cause hurt. Let us seek God and his guidance in all that we do. Read God's word, run our ideas by what the Bible says when we want to help. Check in with other Christians, build relationships with each other so that you can work on outdoing one another. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Um, and if this is something that um, touched your heart, there's a couple resources. One of them is um, on Right Now Media, which we have a free subscription if you want to get that on our website on crhillside.com. There's a study called when, um, when Helping Hurts. And it's great if your group, small group, wants to get it together. You can do it individually. Um, you can reach out to me and we can talk through it. Another resource that I found was um, a book called Reading Scripture Through Western Eyes, and it really helped me to understand the helping without the um, worrying about the person's soul was damaging.
So if you, um, oh no, sorry, again, if you know, are not in a small group, make sure to talk to Pastor Dave at the check-in or the next step station out in the foyer. So if this touched your heart in any way, if God spoke to you, um, if you would just pray with me, um, for and then I think Jay is coming up. Darn it. <clears throat> Dearly Father, Holy Spirit, thank you for for speaking to us today. Um, fill this place in our hearts with your awesome goodness and love. Let us experience love and not just feel it. From the depths of our souls, with your goodness and love, your mercy and peace, O oh God, we acknowledge that under our own power we can't do good. We need you and your power and grace. We can't do any good in this world without you. Let us remember that and rely on you in your son's name. 